Hello everyone again. This is Dr. Zizzy. Checking in with you for the Unit 2 podcast here. The Summer Online Course Exercise Psychology. We are going to check out um, one of the most interesting theories, I think, to help you understand why the U.S. has experienced some of the most rapid changes in physical activity patterns and obesity, uh, primarily obesity and nutritional patterns, although physical activity is getting to become a more, uh, more challenging. And in this unit also, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time explaining the assignments that you're expected to complete and also looking over the websites that you're asked to evaluate. Um, so let's have a look at what's going to be covered in this particular unit. Um, in this unit, the main topics are going to be talking about what is the built environment. And much of this material you're going to see in the podcast here is not part of your textbook. And so it's additional material beyond that that you should be familiar with. Um, but much of it does come from one of your readings, um, the Salas and Owen uh, chapter reading that goes over the social ecological model. So we're going to look at what, it, what are the characteristics of the built environment. Uh, we're going to look at some research on uh, walkability and also the built environment and obesity uh, to see some of the impact. Um, and one of the major assignments you have for this unit is a walkability uh, assignment. There's a checklist in the unit 2 folder that you're asked to complete. And so what you want to do for that assignment um, is to um, pick a good spot to go for a walk. I mean, wherever you're living now, as long as it's safe. And uh, let's, uh, I think I have some notes here on that. Let's have a quick look at uh, those notes. They are here. So the, really the question becomes, how walkable is your environment? Um, what kind of issues do you encounter? And the checklist, for example, has you identify if there's noise or traffic or trash. Um, newer developments that are built, are they walkable? Um, so if you don't feel like you want to walk from your house, like it's not safe, um, then of course you can go and drive somewhere and go for a walk. But the idea is to walk in some sort of neighborhood setting as opposed to on a trail or a state park or something of that nature. But if that's all you have access to, um, that's fine as well. Uh, if you do happen to have a pedometer, I'm going to talk a bit about pedometers here, then you could go ahead and uh, um, check that as well so you know how many steps did you get, how long did it go. Um, and you want to really be observant during your walk about what kind of barriers, uh, negative factors did you notice, and then what kind of positive factors did you notice. Is one of the biggest changes that has occurred in um, the built environment in the U.S. is it's become more challenging to, um, to walk for physical activity and to bike. Um, and basically because we've spent uh, so much more time focusing on cars and dependence on uh, automotive transport. Um, so that should be good for your walkability assignment. For the website evaluation, uh, we'll have a look in a moment at a couple of the, the websites I've asked you to review. And um, I think you'll like some of those. So what I want you to do is check them out uh, under your own terms and see what you find interesting from those particular websites. And these will be two websites that um, focus on the interaction of physical activity um, and environmental features and then also what type of interventions actually work to uh, treat obesity and physical activity issues. Your behavior change project, you should have feedback by now um, related to your uh, goals that you had proposed. So you should check back in your journal and you should receive feedback from myself or from Alessandro related to the goal or goals you've set. Uh, and so based on the feedback that one of us has given you, that you can go ahead and begin to start your behavior change experiment. And then your journal is used to document on a weekly basis really how things are going. So your behavior change journal is not your log where you report that I did 30 minutes at the rack, I also went for a run for 15 minutes. That's your log that you'll need to be keeping track of. That's a self-monitoring log. But your journal is really a reflection, you know, a few par couple paragraphs a week where you said, you know, this week was a really good week and then you explain why it went really well. Or, you know, it didn't go so well, here's some barriers I encountered and Here's why I don't think it went well. So you should just be a reflection on that. And you're really just graded on 
not if you passed or failed the process, but whether or not you've evaluated it effectively. Now, your interview assignment is not due uh, until Unit 3. Uh, I should probably make a note of that here on my, on my slide, so I'll go that. I'll do that. Uh, but you should be going out and trying to collect the data now. So the interview questions uh, should be posted um, in Unit 2 or Unit 3 materials. I can't remember where I put them. But you should check that out, and they'll say you know, final interview questions. So everyone will be using the exact same set of questions uh, to conduct those interviews. So you're going to have a sedentary person and you're going to have an active person and you're going to ask them basically the same set of questions with a couple exceptions. Um, and try not to choose two people that are totally different. So don't pick someone who's in the military uh, ROTC program and then someone else who is uh, you know a computer science person that just sits around all day. Try to pick two people that actually have similar lifestyles. So if you want to talk to two stay-at-home moms or two working mothers and one of them is very active and one of them is not, that would be a good comparison. Uh, or two college uh, juniors, one of which is really active and one of which is not. You must have the same gender and uh, you don't want these people to be your roommates. You want them to be someone else, a friend of a friend or another acquaintance, okay? It's useful if you know them because you'll have better rapport with them anyway. Okay, so although there are only a couple uh, assignments in this unit, the walkability and the website evaluation, you do need to be getting started on your behavior change and you should be going out and trying to find your interviewees. Uh, and of course, in addition, you've got your reading quiz um, uh, coming up in this unit in a couple weeks. So uh, the due dates are on your syllabus for all that stuff and they're also posted on eCampus. And let's get on with it. All right, so where do we begin? Let's have a look at our website. So the first place we're gonna check out is Active Living by Design. And uh, I'm going to take you over there right now. All right. So here's your website. You can check that out and you can check out the link. And I'm just going to show you so a couple of the features of this particular website. Actually, this is a town I used to live in here in uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Uh, I used to ride my bike up that very street. I noticed they had just posted that uh, when I was going to class. Um, you can have a look at what exactly this organization is, for example. Um, and I'm sorry I have to move this around a little bit, but my window is not giving me uh, too much information. Um, yeah, and then this happens, of course. <laughs> All right, here you go. Um, you can have a look at, you know, in terms of the mission, uh, creates community-led change by working with local and national partners to build, to build a culture of active living and healthy eating. So it's really about changing communities through design of those communities, so active living by design. And those designs could be access to fruits and vegetables, to farmers markets, could be access to trails, could be walking. Sorry about that. Sorry about the interruption there. Um, you never know what's going to happen sometimes when you start one of these podcasts. Um, getting back to active living by design, this is an organization, they employ quite a few people and uh, they have a lot of people that work out of the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill and they, you can, you can see they're, they're funded through national agencies. So they got uh, you know, North Carolina State Institute, you got the um, School of Public Health there at UNC and then also Robert Wood Johnson Foundation which is a um, large uh, public health organization that funds groups like this to do the type of research that they do. And so what I encourage you to do is flip through some of their approaches, um, some of the things that they, um, that they do, and you can see what their models are, their strategies, some case studies. These are actually really cool uh, that show uh, projects uh, that they have already completed. And so you might want to read uh, through some of those case studies. Okay, because they do a really good job of, of highlighting some of those features and... Uh, giving examples of ex exactly what they're talking about. And there's uh, 25 across the country, I believe, yeah, created uh, 25 communities that represent the work. So they have some real good practical uh, applications. A lot of times I think, um, you know, I spend a lot of time talking about theories in, the, in my classes and students get a little frustrated with theories, but in this case, these are theories-based um, issues um, and really applications of what they're doing. So it's a very useful website. I do encourage you to check it out. Um, the second website is a, a little bit more research focused and it's called the Community Guide and I'll scroll you down just so you can have a look at the 
at the web address there. Um, and this one is specifically related to PA, to physical activity. So you'll notice on the left hand side here, this is a function of the uh, Centers for Disease Control. And um, you can see other topics here if you wanted to check out uh, community guide topics related to any of these other topic areas, you could and you would get different uh, information. So this one is specifically related to um, physical activity, which is what I'd like you to check out. Okay, now coming back over here, um, if, you, if you scroll down a little bit on this page, you'll see that they have a lot of guidelines, um, recommendations, you could get those here, and those are also linked from the eCampus website. And then there are systematic reviews for each of the different types of intervention approaches that you guys will be reading about in your textbook, your Locks et al. textbook. And uh, you know you have media-based campaigns and information style, a lot of more of the sports psych stuff here under behavioral and social approaches. And then the, the unit we're talking about right now are environmental and policy approaches. So in other words, these documents are providing a summary of evidence on if you change the environment or if you change a policy, uh, what kind of impact does that have? And you can have a look here in terms of what those may be. So the physical environment, um, social networks, norms, uh, and then other policies. So when you scroll down, they have a bunch of recommendations here for uh, whether or not um, these type of interventions um, actually work. And so the recommendation status in four of the five here shows you that with uh, policy and environmental uh, interventions, there's really strong evidence to improve physical activity rates. And you can read about all of these different types of techniques in your book. Now, if we come back a level and look just at the, at the information approaches, you know, uh, all that time you spent in health education in high school, and maybe you've taken a nutrition class, and all the times you've seen mass media campaigns for the Verb campaign for NFL Play 60, all of those nice things that sound great, they don't work. Uh, they do not result in increased physical activity. Now, if you're able to take that campaign into a community level, as, such as Morgantown Walks, and you make it uh, very specific to that community, and you identify where they could walk, you reduce barriers to that, you put it on TV, you put it on email, it can work then. Okay. And if you want to know what any of these are, you can kind of get more specific information on all of them. So I do encourage you to spend some time, interact with them on these web pages any way you like. I found them to be two of the most useful um, uh, websites uh, in, in my work doing the research um, throughout, throughout quite a bit, many years, and many years now. Okay, so come on back. Let's go ahead and get on with the lecture. I think. Hey, all right. Now, one of the chapters that you didn't, uh, were not asked to read out of Food Fight is um, one of the last chapters where they bring it all together. And if you want to get that book, I would highly recommend it if you're a person that's going to end up as a personal trainer or, or a coach or a phys ed teacher, um, an athletic trainer. Uh, it's really an excellent book. And so these are some of the big strategies they suggest for uh, how we can begin to fight the good fight, basically. And you'll notice that many of these things are targeting environmental change, such as more transport dollars. Okay, and you can see here like, the comparison between how much is spent on walking per person in the United States versus uh, per person per on the road. So we're spending obviously significant money just to put down pavement so cars can go and we can fuel the economy. But we're not necessarily taking into account uh, people walking on those same roads. Um, design, so active living by design, activity friendly community. So when we're building new community centers, when we're building new uh, shopping plazas, we should be designing with uh, the idea that people need to walk in that area. Um, building facilities correctly deals with that. And then promoting physical activity at school are the next two suggestions, particularly for adolescents, young adults. Uh, it's an area that we have as captive audience for folks. Um, decrease sedentary behavior um, and they don't really make a clear argument here about uh, how they're going to do that because uh, obviously that's that's a common uh, issue every time I talk to students in my classes about well, why is this a problem or why is obesity a problem they always bring up oh there's just too many video games but 
you know, like I said in the first unit, that's just as too simple of a solution. Um, if we can find ways to incentivize PE, uh, physical activity, that's what PA is in all these, and to promote worksite PA so those adults can actually get physical activity while they're at work before they have to go home and deal with their kids or uh, take care of their mom or their dad. Um, you know, so basically you want to capture uh, and get people to be active at school because that's where they are and then for adults, kids at school rather, and then adults where they're working um, because that's and then you get um, older adults, retired adults at community centers and other places where they congregate. So you target specific age groups and populations in the communities and in the locations where you can catch them. Uh, the link between physicians and physical activity is one in, which we, in, in West Virginia which we're strongly considering. Um, there may be uh, very soon benefits, so if you uh, have uh, walking or some other physical activity prescribed uh, through your doctor, that would actually be covered through your insurance, which would be a huge change in the model. Um, and exercise would be viewed as a viable health care alternative, uh, which I think is a huge, uh, uh, huge potential incentive in a way of looking at it and uh, reinforcing it, because hundreds and hundreds of people every day in West Virginia would be seeing their doctor for heart disease, diabetes, other comorbid conditions, and one way to start working on changes instead of giving them a pill would be, well, what I want you to do is go out and start walking 30 minutes a day, come back and see me in a month, and let me, let's me let check your levels again. Um, in many cases, it may have a positive uh, impact on that. All right, so now looking at the levels of the, of the built environment, coming out of one of your readings, uh, they go from uh, very narrow and small up to much larger um, levels of scale. So here is kind of your classic exercise psych area in the interpersonal um, side of things. You have um, all of you know your your motivation, your intrinsic, extrinsic um, factors, um, the theories here that we uh, discussed in the first level, trans theoretical model, um, relapse prevention, theory of planned behavior, those are the models we looked at in the first unit. Then you move up, so you imagine this would be the middle of a, of a circle. So you imagine that would be the middle and the smallest area of influence critical to determining that individual's physical activity. And then you step out into the micro environment, which really deals with social support, um, what you're seeing in terms of social learning, what are other people doing. And then the behavioral economics is, well, what can you afford? How does this work? So if you are... Um, a working mother with very little actual time to yourself and you're probably not going to spend that doing uh, um, leisure time physical activity you might spend it uh, working a second job you might uh, be trying to go back to school uh, and doing it that so the behavioral economics would not weigh out for you to be spending time doing leisure physical activity moving out into the uh, meso environment is kind of like your neighborhood whether or not you have parks and restorative environments Behavior settings just refers to, do you, do you have places to be active in your community? So here in Morgantown, for example, we have Rec Center if you're a student. You have the Rail Trail, which is free to everyone for walking, biking. Um, you do have some pools that are, um, that are open in warmer months. And then you have a couple community centers, but it's somewhat limited in that regard. Um, there's plenty of parks and and then we have um, some of the state parks uh, close by as well. Environmental stress has to do a lot with um, smog or uh, traffic or other barriers to uh, physical activity promotion in your, uh, your local community and your environment. And then as you move up, you get into more macro environmental features that are how's land used, um, how's transportation planned, is it, is it well organized, and, for many of you that, that live in Morgantown, uh, you probably have a good feeling that it's not laid out pretty well, and that's very true. That's very true. So all the levels of the built environment, these are explained also in your textbook, going from internal to internal con control all the way out to more policy. And they're, they're, they're labeled here as choice-driven, meaning my choice, my attitudes, my thoughts, and then choice-enabling, meaning if I live in an environment that is more enabling of physical activity, then it just makes it easier on me, reduces the overall barriers um, to deal with that issue. Now a couple looking at uh, pedometers, one area in which I've done some research over the last 10 years or so. Um, and pedometers, if you're not familiar, are simply little things you can put on your belt that will track the number of steps that you take in a given day, week, period of time, okay? 
and so they just they don't track much of anything uh, some of them can track calories and how far you walked if you calibrate them but the idea is that um, by simply becoming more aware of that and this is linking back to walkability and I mentioned you could you could use a pedometer becoming more aware of your physical activity levels um, may increase that motivation to be more active or of the fact that you're already active or that you're inactive and then just wearing it and, and making sure you're having it on uh, increases step counts uh, and by 15 20 percent in some instances um, not by setting goals not by doing anything more complicated but just simply by wearing the pedometer and you might ask yourself well why does that occur do you think why putting a little instrument on your belt that tells you okay today so far you've walked a thousand steps Think for yourself for a second. Why could that provide any benefit at all? Can you think about it? Um, one of the biggest benefits, it's somewhat like goal setting, is that uh, it's an awareness benefit, a mindfulness benefit. So if it's out of mind, you know, at the end of a day, and you don't have a number in front of your pedometer to tell you, you know what, wow, you're 3,000 steps short of uh, what would be considered to be an active day, and you're not keeping track of that, then likely you're not worried about it. You're going to watch your TV program and go down. But if you have set a goal that, hey, I want to reach 10,000 steps, which is a common goal, and you realize after dinner you're at 7,000, well, maybe then you go get on your treadmill or you take your dog for a couple walks around the block. Um, that awareness, that mindfulness is probably the key feature that increases that. Um, you know, the reason they've been useful in our research is that you know, the old ACSM, American College of Sports Medicine idea, was you had to go work out at you know 65 to 80 percent of your heart rate max and you know you were given a, a rating of perceived exertion that's what this RPE is here and it was very complex to try to figure out what the heck you were doing so you had to go do it for 20 to 30 minutes or it didn't count so whereas literally every step counts with a pedometer so if I go for a walk for five minutes because that's all I can squeeze in then those steps count and they add up to my accumulated evidence um, as I mentioned before, you know, two to four thousand step increase just by using pedometers. Uh, although some of this research has been done out in Colorado and San Diego, and when we did some research with um, pedometers in West Virginia, we saw much smaller uh, sizes of effect, maybe around a thousand um, out in West Virginia rural high schools. So if you don't have environments, the built environment is the topic here we're talking about today, in which people could walk then of course they're not going to accumulate many more steps. So uh, why so much emphasis on uh, walkability and why would walking be so important? You know a lot of times I work with college students and I have them in class, I have you guys in class all the time and and the attitude is often well what, what does walking do for you? You know maybe they were an athlete in high school, maybe they're an athlete now and they think well walking is not even exercise. Well but to the contrary I mean we have to lose the idea that exercise has to be sport or vigorous or intense because frankly you know in the in the population of Americans and the global population if we could have more people walking 15 20 30 40 minutes a day their health would be significantly improved because many people remember from the last unit you're talking about 50 percent of people are meeting guidelines about so that means for 50 percent of the people in the country 150 million people are not getting enough physical activity. So for those people, uh, they're not going out and running marathons. They're not running 5Ks. They're not riding their bike for 10 miles on the weekend. We just want to start them with something that is familiar. Everybody walks, basically, unless you have a disability. Um, it's cheap. Everyone has access to somewhere they can walk, typically, within a close distance that's safe. Uh, it doesn't require any instruction, any classes, anything. So. It's simply the cheapest, most convenient strategy, and it is the most common physical activity reported uh, in the United States, and I'm sure it is worldwide as well. Um, Definition-wise, what is walkability? Uh, you can see some features highlighted here. Um, the extent to which the built environment supports and encourages walking. That's really the focus, and so that's what you're looking for when you go out um, on your uh, on your walkability assign, uh, assignment using the the checklist and the two features of walkability that we'll uh, discuss are proximity and connectivity so proximity means uh, that you have access to you somewhere you would like to walk that's comfortable and safe 
that could be a park, that could be a grocery store, that could be a school, that could be a trail. Okay, so proximity is how close it is as the bird flies. Connectivity is can you actually walk there in a functional way? So just to give you an example, uh, you know, from Morgantown, sorry for those of you who are outside of the town, but, you know, we have a major thoroughfare, Beechhurst. That's, uh, you know, basically a three-car, a three-lane highway, uh, and folks drive pretty fast there. And on one side of it is the river, and there's a rail trail right beside that river. And on the other side, there's plenty of apartments, and the campus is there, and there's a lot of people live right across that that road so it's actually quite close to get to the rail trail but there's very few uh, connections that make it functional so it's not safe oftentimes to take your children across that street you literally have to park right beside the trail to be able to use it and so just to give you an example of some things you might want to be looking for on your walkability assignment um, a colleague of mine Christian Dr. Abilzo he um, he documented his walk from the Health Science Center or the hospitals up here in Morgantown um, over to a neighborhood community. And I think the walk maybe took him uh, 15 or 20 minutes and we're just going to have a look at some of the features that he identified in the environment that affect walkability. Okay, so starting out from the Health Science Center, this is behind the Health Science Center. You can see here one of the uh, features that you should notice initially here is the uh, well-identified crosswalks. Okay, and nice wide walking paths here. So in terms of appearance, nice, looks safe. Visually, you know, not that attractive really. Not a lot of trees. I wouldn't call this a restorative environment, but it's certainly functional uh, for walking at the starting point. Okay, um, heading down the steps, you know, nice wide steps here. Now, obviously, this is not ADA, so if you have a disability, you had some other person with you with a wheelchair, this wouldn't fly well. Okay, whoops, sorry about that. And then coming over onto this side, you can see uh, this is crossing over the hospital well identified and you'll even notice more closely here there's little stop signs in the middle of the street to help the driver and there's also a stop sign right over here that helps identify the driver hey stop for pedestrians so it's actually very clearly marked and one of the only places in Morgantown that I'm aware of that there are uh, so many indications that pedestrians are given preference most other places uh, uh, automotive uh, automobiles are given preference now from there it gets a little bit sketchier so here just to get up to those stairs up there so these are the stairs from that part uh, and he's walking over towards the back side of the stadium if you're not familiar these would be the tailgating lots for those of you who come up here uh, for football game days you know walking through this parking lot a little bit sketchy you have to look out for cars all the time not a particularly safe enjoyable place to walk and then as you get back up here fairly well marked you do have to go upstairs so it's going to require some difficulty you can't avoid hills in Morgantown moving up to the street level behind this now you say hmm where am I supposed to walk now here comes a car uh, there's really nowhere for the pedestrian to be at that point and then as you cross over the parking lot there you can see a randomly um, sidewalk moving up to the street up to the street level so there's really no coherent path or design here in this particular case so this emphasizes connectivity is lacking between all of the existing features it's just a patchwork and as many of you know that's how Morgantown's built. So here's the top of the hill. You actually see here there's a there's a disability grade ramp here as if someone would bring their wheelchair or something up here. Um, here's the street. Cars everywhere. This is actually quite a dangerous crossing because the hill comes up on both sides here. And then heading down here you can see it's slightly more restorative. Now there's no space to walk. There are no sidewalks here. But there's also no traffic and you're off of the main highway. So in some cases that can be okay. Now when you get out to the other road, you can see this is the width of the sidewalk. So even, even though there is a sidewalk here, if a car came, you're definitely not feeling very safe. And so a walkable environment should have a clearly indicated place for people, for pedestrians to be, and then there should be some separation between those pedestrians and uh, and traffic and otherwise folks are not going to feel safe at all so you imagine here if you're walking beside if I was walking with one of my kids there's not room for either one of us I would just pick them up I mean that's just not going to fly so you know in, in recapping those uh, those issues um, it, it's really something that when I, I grew up in West Virginia and I would have never been able to tune into that um, you know why is it such a big deal to have walkable environments um, 
and you can have a look here like the built environment you will almost double the number of walking trips if you have a highly walkable versus a low walkable community now and these are for utilitarian purposes that means you know I want to go to the park with my kids so we walk to the park or I want to go I need to take my kids to school we walk I need to go pick up some milk I walked uh, those are utilitarian trips so if we're able to double the amount of walking trips in a highly walkable versus low walkable community you can imagine that that would generate a significantly uh, higher level of walking imagine we did that in every single community in the country or in West Virginia it would be a, you know, a massive increase um, in the walking race between that and so if we can transform a community from low walkability to high walkability or we can build new developments that are highly walkable then just by the design we've now enabled more choices and people without barriers will be more likely to choose those not all of them but many of them may choose those um, the cool thing about the built environment and, and physical activity is I've been lucky enough to go to a couple conferences uh, at the Active Living Research Conference, which is another very cool conference to check out if you guys are interested. Uh, you can check them out at activelivingresearch.org. You'll get to meet people that are engineers, I mean, people who are designing the sidewalks and the slopes. Uh, you'll meet people who are build it, who do buildings and design, really cool creative careers. You'll meet sociologists, you'll meet people that work in, uh, in traffic design. So I met uh, last year in San Diego, I met this guy that works in Stockholm, Sweden, and evaluates um, stoplights and interchanges. And he'll look at, for example, they'll they'll look at, um, let's say, the top ten intersections in a city where the accidents are the highest. And then they will redesign those and monitor the changes that occur due to redesign. So they might add a walking trail. They might improve the the um, time it takes uh, for folks to walk or a time allowed for them to walk they'll, they'll make changes they'll monitor it to see if it actually works so it's pretty cool because uh, think about how many people would come through an intersection in a city in a given day so you're looking at very costly interventions changes to environments that have the potential to impact uh, thousands and thousands of people per day you know one of the biggest things that they did here in Morgantown since I've lived here I've been living here 15 years is they built the rail trail you know, when I moved here, there was no rail trail, which meant there's literally no flat place to walk except circles around the Coliseum and the football stadium. That was about it. And I guess football stadium is clearly not flat. So when they built that, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people are coming every day. It was a major change. It's a pretty big investment, and it's had an impact on a lot of people, both uh, economically and physically as well. So there's a lot of discipline studying this area. And this is one interesting uh uh, graph to check out is the change in um, this is a percent change over the last 20 years in different types of trips so the purple here is your walking trip so we've seen in 20 years a decrease in 50 percent in uh, terms of when you leave your house are you taking your are you walking or biking or taking your car what are you doing um, population has grown Okay, folks have to commute farther, drive more miles, and look at the percent change of the time spent in traffic in 20 years. You're two, over 200% increase in the time spent in traffic. And this is, you know, mind you, in, in the last 20 years, we haven't spent less money on building roads. We spent significantly more. And so the idea here is that when you make more room and you spend more money for, for uh, car travel, you do not hear me you do not decrease traffic you increase traffic if you make more uh, room for uh, bikers walkers on a road and you have less room for cars more people will white walk and bike and less people would drive so if you want to reduce traffic you actually need to reduce space for cars somewhat counterintuitive logic um, some research uh, it's been fairly a strong relationship between the built environment um, and then some of the physical um, uh, parameters here. You know, if you have a look like uh, those in low walkability neighborhoods are more likely to be classified as overweight. You know, so you might think about what kind of neighborhood you want to live in. Um, being overweight or obese over as Perth is in Australia, associated with living on a highway um, or poor access to recreational facilities. 
sprawl, uh, meaning um, you know suburban sprawl of malls and plazas and concrete, is associated with BMI and risk of obesity. Um, and then on the flip side, like in Atlanta and some of the newer developed areas, mixed land use, meaning properties that are used for multiple purposes, like an apartment building that has a, uh, a subway station in it or a convenience store or grocery store, um, those mixed land uses and then distance walk are associated with reduced obesity. And more time you spend in your car, increased obesity. Um, and then also another one just pretty interesting in terms of access to fast food. So uh, the more population you have per fast food restaurant increased uh, the obesity prevalence. So if you just put, and of course that's what McDonald's does, they want to put their stores where they're going to get the most business. So when you do that, you do increase obesity. So don't be fooled by the devil that is McDonald's. The three components that we're going to review closely are the built environment of the transportation system, land use patterns, and urban design characteristics. Uh, so we'll look at these quickly and then we'll wrap up the this podcast for unit number two. The transportation system, um, a lot of factors that um, that I certainly was never familiar with when I uh, first started studying this mater uh, material is, uh, you know, you look at the street network and that's of course how it's designed. Um, and you may you know, think about what type of area you grew up in. I grew up on a normal grid type pattern street. There was no cul-de-sacs. There were no connectors. Transit systems and whether you have a public transit system. And uh, you should know that like um, in New York City, for example, which has the highest walking in the country um, and a you know, well-designed public transport system, it increases physical activity because people will make the choice then not to drive their car. So then even though they're taking public transit, they are walking to and from that public transit, be it a bus or everything else. Um, separated systems, uh, meaning for bike and uh, bikers and walkers are not asked to walk in the road. There is a bike lane, there is some sort of separation and space in the road system. That's something we clearly don't have in Morgantown. I mean, I bike occasionally, I walk a lot, and uh, I'm at times, you know, fearful for my own existence uh, around the roads here. And I would certainly never permit my children to be on many of those uh, roads that I take. Additionally, into the system, uh, the connectivity is what we talked about. Um, you know, these are some of the factors that affect, you know, how are the streets laid out? How long are the blocks? What's the speed of traffic? So you can figure all these things out intuitively. So if uh, if they have sidewalks, that's a plus. If the lengths of blocks are shorter, so it makes it seem like easier to walk versus super long blocks, slower traffic, okay, and then good interconnections between land uses. So in other words, you wouldn't want um, to walk in an industrial area for 19 blocks. It would seem like a very scary area. So you'd want to have, you know, residential next to a business next to another business next to residential so that there's interconnection between different land uses whereas if it's all business there's no one living there then the system transportation system wouldn't make a lot of sense there either so the connectivity and the, the blend of those systems is pretty useful to consider uh, the second factor is land use uh, and that is uh, zoning issues residential commercial and basically in, in West Virginia I've come to understand there's very poor and very uh, confusing zoning so that's why you'll see um, just poor planning in general um, that's why you'll see a trailer park next to a grocery store next to uh, <coughs> a four hundred thousand dollar house uh, because the zoning is not controlled where if you go out to other areas of the country they control zoning quite strictly and you would never see uh, a hot spot or a strip club pop up next to uh, a student housing complex. It just simply is not allowed in the law. Over here it's a lot looser. And so um, these are a couple of the factors that you're not going to be test on density and mix. It refers to the types of land use that affect built environment. The last is the urban design or the design of it. And these are really the psychology of it, uh, also referred to as ecological psychology. And that is uh, the perceptions of it. So what does the architecture um, create? What kind of feelings does it create? Um, what's the landscaping look like? Is it attractive? What's the curb appeal? You know, you'll hear people use that in real estate 
situations situations you know this is another one it's kind of they did in morgantown downtown the lighting at pedestrian scale so you take away the huge um, lights that you might see in a parking lot and you replace them with smaller lights that are maybe 10 12 feet high and it makes the environment appear to be much safer and uh, much more appropriate and then you just clean it up so that people want to be there you, know, you put the dumpsters away you put the sidewalk garbage away somewhere else so that it's a has the perception of cleanliness safety even if it's not um, so those perceptual factors uh, and design factors may really bring someone out uh, to a location or may discourage them from being there now I know a lot of the material in this particular unit was um, different was technical and so I hope what it's done is got caused you to think a little differently um, from a broader context and I know as a psychologist a person that always thinks about individual behavior first it's really helpful for me to come up a couple levels and think about the external built environment and the influence it's had on uh, on us and our culture and basically the argument made in food fight and that I would agree with is that changes to the built environment and also policy changes laws uh, are the primary contributors to why in the last 20 years uh, the health of the United States has gotten um, worse more quickly than in other places so it's not laziness uh, I'm sure there is a contributing factors there uh, it's not video games only it's not all those little things okay it's it's the big picture that's having the biggest influence it still doesn't mean we don't have choice and personal responsibility we do simply it's gotten more difficult over the last 20 years and you could talk to your parents about that I would encourage you guys to do that and see if that is truly the case for them so ask them you know 30 years ago was it easier to be physically active was it safer do they feel like it was safer to send the kids out into the street I know we did when I was a kid I went out in the street I rode my bike wherever I wanted to go I rode to school walked to school didn't think a single thing of it and now many people would never send their kids out there even though still the same towns still the same towns in West Virginia so hopefully you got some use out of the out of this particular podcast and I look forward to seeing you in unit three let me know if you have questions so make sure you send me an email okay